Elden Ring was packed so densely with content that here we are, over two years later, and we're still figuring things out from the base game even with the massive expansion Shadow of the Earth Tree just a few months away. But even though there is plenty of theorizing to be done about who Mesmer the Impaler is and what his backstory could be, and what possible connections he could have to Merica and whether or not he impaled her, we can't forget about the mysteries that we have yet to solve as a community from the base game. One of the biggest of these mysteries that has persisted since day one is that of the fate of the the gentle giant known as E.G., Ronnie's war counselor and personal friend. As you no doubt know since you've clicked on this video, things don't exactly end well for old E.G., uh, unless of course you consider being burned alive with black flames to be a good time. But since it's been just over two years since the game released and lots of people have undoubtedly moved on from the game and its deep pockets of lore and maybe a bit rusty, just so we're on the same page, allow me to recap E.G.'s full story so that you can re-familiarize yourself with the character. And hey, you might might even learn something new that you hadn't seen or thought of initially. War Counselor E.G. is a friendly troll that has two professions. He is the dedicated and skilled blacksmith of the Carrion royal family, who apparently employs many trolls in their ranks, some of which we can face in combat in-game. E.G. is also the War Counselor for Lunar Princess Rani, the last and only remaining princess of Carrion royalty. He claims that he has known Rani all her life, along with her shadow, Blythe the Half-Wolf, who E.G. refers to as Rani's half-brother when you first meet him, which isn't exactly true. Actually, E.G. has a bit of a habit of hiding the truth from people, which we'll see more of in just a bit. We can gather a bit more about his backstory from his old acquaintance, Castellan Jaren, who was once a guest of the Carrion royal family, which is where he knew E.G. from, who at the time was their blacksmith. It's also most likely where Jaren met the famous and most powerful demigod Star Scourge Radon, who is the son of Renala, queen of the full moon. Although, as you know, Radon eventually decided to side with his father Radigan and the Golden Order and oppose the Carrion royal family by halting the stars in their orbit, which is figuratively and literally connected to the Carrion destiny. But that's beside the point. Sorry, Radon is just one of those characters that's so cool you can't help but talk about him. Jaren also mentions that E.G. would always make such dull weapons, which is strange for a blacksmith. But ironically, these dulled weapons that E.G. would make were always immune to the decay of the Scarlet Rot, which is very interesting. Scarlet Rot is an all-consuming disease that stems from the ancient Outer God of Rot, whose essence has been sealed within the Lake of Rot and is no respecter of materials. That stuff will infect anything. Its spread can only be held back by fire, which is what the soldiers of Redmain Castle use to prevent the Rot from taking over their final stronghold. This also means that E.G.'s weapons must have been imbued with some sort of fire in the smithing process that caused them to be dull, but more on that later. E.G. was always involved in Ronnie's life, claiming that he knew her and Blythe since they were both children, and even that they would allow him to join in on their playtime. He also refers to himself as Ronnie's childhood warden, and because of this, I like to think of his relationship to the both of them as sort of a father figure, since Ronnie's father Radigan was absent, I believe, for her entire life, as I personally think that she was the gift that Radigan gave to Renala when he left her for Merica, the first child of the Rune of the Unborn, which means that Radigan might not have ever met his daughter Rani. Regardless, because of this, the implications here are that E.G. filled that fatherly void, and once Rani became older and developed her own sense of the world and what she planned to do with it, he stepped away from his duties as the Carrion family's blacksmith and became Rani's war counselor full-time, signifying his true allegiance with Rani herself. He dedicated all of his wisdom to aiding her in her quest, discarding her flesh and following the dark path of the Empyrean, regardless of what that meant or who she had to betray. And this is what his status was at the time of meeting us, the player Tarnished. E.G. and Blythe had spent years going on expeditions trying to find the mysterious underground city known as Nokron one of the twin eternal cities, in order to further the destiny of Lady Rani. However, even though they found the city physically, they were stumped for who knows how long attempting to actually get into Nokron, which is where you come into the picture, assisting the duo with entering Nokron by talking to either Sorceress Selen or Castellan Jaren, either of which will give a hint to the fact that Starscrid's Redan must die in order for the stars to be allowed to move once again, since, you know, he's holding them back since he's a badass. Which, like I mentioned earlier, is literally what needs to happen for Ronnie's destiny to move once again. After Radon is defeated by you, a star does indeed resume its course and becomes a meteor that crashes into the lands between, opening an entirely new path into Nokron that was previously completely inaccessible. 
After this, E.G. commends you on your massive achievement, you know, defeating the general in combat, and interestingly, comments about the fact that he hopes Jaren will resume his previously promised quest, ridding the family of a, quote, long-standing carrion weed. As a side note, he's referring to the fact that Jaren, who is a renowned swordsman, had promised the carrion family that he would kill the sorceress Selen for her betrayal of the family, which you can also help him to do or not do. But anyway, E.G. then urges you to descend into Nokron and obtain the precious treasure of the city, not mentioning what that treasure is, and also not mentioning meeting Blythe, which he previously would have absolutely told you to do like he did when you first met. There is a reason for this. Like I mentioned earlier, E.G. hides certain truths from certain people. To Blythe, he hid the fact that he was not actually Ronnie's half-brother, but rather her shadow, a gift given to her, conjured up by her two fingers when they initially chose her as their Empyrean to replace Queen Merica on behalf of the Greater Will. However, as a creation of the two fingers, Fingers, Blythe came with pre-programming. If Rani were to ever resist the will of her two fingers, Blythe would turn from her faithful shadow into a baleful shadow. In other words, he would try to assassinate her. And to you, E.G. hid the fact that the treasure of Nokron that he requested you to obtain instead of Blythe is none other than the Fingerslayer Blade, a testament to the hubris of Nokron, and undisputable proof of Rani's intentions to not only revolt against her two fingers, but to kill them. Since this was clearly a massive sign that Rani was deciding to revolt, he wanted to get out in front of things and therefore made the decision to lock Blythe away within an Everjail. Specifically, the far-off Forlorn Hound Everjail, which Blythe can be seen at previously attempting to kill the Bloodhound Knight Darawil, who he claims, interestingly, is a traitor. If you ask E.G. about Blythe's whereabouts, he will lie to you and state that Blythe has some other very important task that was given to him and that you shouldn't worry about him anymore. At this point, you can either go and find and free Blythe yourself, or wait for him to break out on his own. But if you do decide to free Blythe, who reveals to you in genuine confusion that Eiji is the one who trapped him, you can then return to Eiji and confront him about this, which will finally force him to reveal to you the truth about Blythe's eventual madness and his belief that Blythe must be neutralized. He gives you one final hint as to how to chase after Rani and help her complete her questline, which actually involves killing another shadow, another Blythe, and then allowing her to finally kill her own two fingers and also becoming engaged. But that's beside the point. After this, Ronnie disappears until the end of the game, but a bunch of different confusing things happen all at once, which I'll state briefly. Black Knife assassins show up outside Ronnie's rise, having been killed by Blythe, who is now aggressive towards you, but still sane enough to declare his undying allegiance to Laney Ronnie, after which you put him down like a rabid dog. Then you can speak with Eiji one final time and he delivers some very, very interesting dialogue. He starts by wondering how Blythe escaped from the Everjail, but after that becomes riddled with guilt over the fact that he was wrong about Blythe. The madness could not shake Blythe's love for Rani. Eiji then states that he made a grave misjudgment, shaming himself by pointing out that he thought he was a capable war counselor, and his last words are to Blythe, promising that he would catch up with him in death soon enough, begging for his forgiveness. And when you next see him, he's eerily on his knees, hammer in hand, dead. But it's these final couple details here that make his death the very mystery that it is. He's surrounded by the corpses of three additional Black Knife assassins, and he's permanently burning with black flames. So, now that we've recapped everything there is to know about Eiji, let's start breaking down the mystery behind this last encounter with him and opening the can of speculation at the same time. In the first place, I think Blythe had completely defied his programming and was 100% sane, standing outside her tower, which he believed she was still in, killing anyone who dared to enter since there were literal assassins approaching the building. And since he was betrayed by his closest friend since childhood and father figure Eiji, he didn't know if he could trust you either, and that's why he decided to fight you. Not out of madness, clearly but out of protection. That has nothing to do with Eiji, but I just wanted to put that one out there since I do believe we murdered an innocent man, as does Eiji, and more people should feel bad about that. Anyway, most people know about Eiji imprisoning Blythe, but I don't think people realize what Eiji probably also did to make him this regretful in the end. This definitely feels like he's apologizing for more than just locking him away in a prison for a day. In summary, I think that the Black Knife assassins that were outside Ronnie's tower were not actually targeting Ronnie, as many people assume, 
but were there for Blythe. And I think Eiji is the one who placed the bounty on Blythe's head. I mean, the assassins show up after Ronnie's two fingers were killed, right? So it's not like they could order the hit on her, and nobody else is left alive and sane enough in the world to oppose Ronnie at this point. And what Eiji says right here, It pains me so, but he must be neutralized for Lady Ronnie's sake. Really sounds like he wanted Blythe neutralized dead, not just imprisoned. And remember, Eiji has known Rani and taken care of her and advised her since she was a child, before she had any aspirations to end the Golden Order and everything as we know it. Which means he was there when she burned her own flesh away. He was there when she stole the fragment of the Rune of Death. He was there for the Night of the Black Knives. And he wasn't just there. Eiji is Rani's war counselor. More than likely, he advised this. So who's to say he isn't the one who ordered the assassins to kill Godwin in the first place? Perhaps by some deal or bargain he struck? Or at the very least that he knows how to strike a bargain with these Black Knife assassins? And if you think that's overestimating him, remember, he does strangely possess knowledge of ancient and forgotten legends, such as the treasure of Nokron, as well as having a thorough grasp on the Outer Gods and how to successfully thwart them. And he spends his days and nights reading and studying. So I think it is very safe to assume that Eiji made a bargain with the Black Knife assassins, like he may have done before with Godwin, but to kill Blythe this time. And that is why he was so sorry in the end. But then, one of two things must have happened. Either the deal went bad when Blythe broke out of the Everjail and was no longer the promised easy target to the Black Knife assassins, instead killing several of them. So they in turn went back to Eiji, to the one who struck the deal and promised them an easy kill and attacked him. Or Eiji may have ordered another hit on himself. But more on that in just a second because now it's time to tackle this big question. The one I've been building up to this entire time. Who killed Eiji? Well, the way I see it, the answer is here somewhere, staring us in the face. But there are two possible solutions to this mystery, and you'll have to tell me which one you believe is more believable. The first and most obvious is that the Black Knife assassins who returned to kill Eiji simply finished the job and did just that killed Eiji. The only reason why this isn't as simple to understand and accept is because Eiji is burning with black flames. And if this were any other Joe Schmo game out there, I'd say, okay, whatever, they did this kind of because it looks cool. But this is Elden Ring, people, from software's biggest game of all time, with an attention to detail that makes a Van Gogh portrait look like my drawing of Pikachu. Black Flame is specifically God-slaying flame, used by the Godskin Apostles, the source of which is the Gloam-Eyed Queen's Godslayer Great Sword. There have been several updates and patches to the game since release, and none of these have changed the color of Eiji's ever-burning flames, signifying to me that this is deliberate. Obviously, this is a problem, though, since the Black Knife Assassins use the power of destined death on their blades to kill people. Which, granted, is also a fire, but one that burns black red instead of black white. But I think this has a solution. Remember that the God Slaying Flame is only a husk of what it used to be. This is told to us several times in the game. And once upon a time, the flame was much more potent and could actually kill gods. What changed, you ask? The removal of the Rune of Death. That's right. Before Malekith took the Rune of Death from the Glomide Queen and her God Slayer Greatsword, she used it in order to create the God Slaying Black Flames. And you can probably see where I'm going with this. What if the Black God Slaying Flames as we see them today and the Flames of the Rune of Death are one and the same, and the Black Flames are just what they look like when they lose most of their power? Or for instance, after a kill. Think about it, when the Black Knife Assassins who use Destined Death Empowered Death killed Godwin. He was carved with a black curse mark and was filled with black smoke. And when Eiji was killed, he was burned with black flames. So, possible answer number one is that it was simply the Black Knife assassins that returned to Eiji and killed him for their deal going bad. And he was able to kill three of them before succumbing to the wounds inflicted by their destined death-empowered daggers. Option two, on the other hand, is a bit more speculative, but much more intriguing. And that is that Eiji may have killed himself. Like I just said, he was able to kill the assassins that came for him. It's possible that there were more than three, but clearly he could fend for himself. For this possibility, I'd 
I'd like to remind you about what Jaren said regarding Eiji's blacksmithing. Remember that specifically, the weapons Eiji would smith were always dull, but would never rot from the scarlet rot, implying very strongly that Eiji could somehow imbue his weapons with fire, which is the only known substance to resist the corruption of rot. It seems like a throwaway detail, but remember, there are no throwaway details in Soulsborne games. So it's possible that Eiji, who knew he was going to die after we told him about Blythe's death, said this because he was riddled with guilt and decided then that he would end his own life out of shame. And it's also very possible that the flame that he used to forge his old weapons and to kill himself was none other than the God-slaying flame. The flame of destined death. The question is, how did Eiji get his hands on that particular flame? Well, to state a theory upon a theory, it could be that he is the one who helped to create the source of it, the Godslayer Greatsword, in the first place. Now, this is another theory that I'm not going to go fully into because it's super in-depth and it's not confirmed just yet, but lots of people think that Ronnie the Witch could possibly be the infamous Gloam-Eyed Queen, who opposed Queen Merica and was defeated by Malekith at least back when she was an Empyrean, for several reasons. Her weird eye, her connections to the god-devouring serpent, her desire to revolt against the greater will and overthrow the gods, and of course the fact that she is, or was, an Empyrean, as was the Glomide Queen at one point. Like I said, there's a lot more to that theory both for and against it, so I'm not really going to go into all of that here, but remember that her weapon, the Godslayer Greatsword, is said to be the source of the Black Flame, and it is found within the Divine Tower of Kaled, completely unaffected by the Scarlet Rot, and is a completely blunt weapon. There is no edge on it, which is very strange for a sword, and fits with the description of the blunt weapons E.G. Woodsmith according to Jaren. So in a nutshell, it's possible that E.G. was the war counselor and blacksmith of the Gloam-Eyed Queen, who for the purposes of this theory could be Ronnie the Witch. But like I said, Ronnie being the Dusk-Eyed Queen is an entire other theory that encompasses lore regarding Destined Death, Melina, and Merica herself, so I'll just leave that where it is for now. If you would like for me to make a video regarding who I believe the Glomide Queen is, because I do have several thoughts on the subject, let me know in the comments below. And also let me know who you think delivered E.G. the Troll's fate to him. Was he slain by the Black Knife assassins who used destined death on him, smoldering his body with black flames and killing him forever? Or did he elect to take his own life, using the black god-slaying flames that he himself had a hand in creating? Let me know what you think in the comments below, and whichever commenters have the most likes on their answers, will be regarded as the solution to this original Elden Ring mystery. Thank you so much for watching. If you would be so kind, please consider leaving a like on this video to get it spread around to other Elden Ring fans just like you and me, and generate more hype for the expansion coming in just a few short months. And if we have a good turnout on this video, I will continue to make Elden Ring theories. And speaking of which, subscribe if you haven't already for much more Elden Ring lore. Be sure to check out my other videos covering Blythe's story in full as well as Ronnie the Witch, which I will leave a link to in the description below. And finally, come say hi to me on Twitter. It'll be good to connect. And stay tuned, I may be streaming Elden Ring this week actually, so come hang out. Okay, that's all I've got for this one, so as always, I will see you in the next video. This is Bandit, signing out. Peace!